You know, during my time in ministry, I have spoken at churches. I counted it up the other day, I was just curious. Um, 14 different states. Ah, there are preachers that have preached in a lot more states than that, but you know, 14 different states, churches in 14 different states. Seven out of the 10 Canadian provinces, a couple other countries to boot. Now some of these congregations were large urban groups. Others were very small churches in remote locations who only had a full-time minister come once per year to give them a seminar on one subject or another. In other words, churches were very, very different socially, economically, culturally. But I noticed that regardless of the size or location, I noticed that every church struggled to make a good witness in their own communities. It seems that wherever the church is located, people outside the church often make the same accusations against us. They accuse Christians of being self-righteous or being hypocritical. Whether it's in Vancouver, Canada or you know, some town in Texas, same accusation. Or they say that we think we're the only ones going to heaven. I mean, I, I've, I've heard that in Manitoba and Nova Scotia and Oklahoma. Same accusation. As a matter of fact, I remember once I was watching the Dave Letterman show and Dave Letterman, sometimes he goes out in the audience, talks to the people, has some game or something that he does in the audience, and he asks the people in the audience, you know, he'll get some guy to stand up, so where are you from and what's your name, what do you do? So he got a man to stand up and he asked them, so where are you from? I'm from such and such a place. And, and so he said to them, and what do you do? And he says, I'm a minister. And Letterman says, oh, what denomination? And the man says, well, I'm a minister for the Church of Christ. And Letterman says, oh, do you think you're the only ones going to heaven? Dave Letterman. I mean, you can't get away from the thing. So, uh, of course, that's, you know, something that we have to deal with no matter where you, where you go and who you are. And then of course there's the old standby that you know, we're legalistic. It's as if everybody else all read the same propaganda about Christians and they swallow it whole without examining it. Of course that Christians are not popular is nothing new. In the first century the favor of Christians among the populace fell dramatically as Nero, who was the emperor in an effort to consolidate his hold on power and divert attention from his leadership failures and crimes, outlawed all religions and especially signaled out Christians accusing them of starting the great fire in Rome. How's that about, you know, how's that for being on the outs? How's that about being criticized? A terrible time of displacement and prejudice and persecution followed for Christians who lived in Rome at that time. Now, at a time that it wasn't popular being a Christian, Peter the Apostle writes a letter to the church giving them some helpful ways to maintain a good reputation in a hostile environment. We're not openly persecuted today, but in this postmodern era where religious people are seen as foolish and insignificant, marginalized, Peter's words provide a good public relations plan for the church to follow. Now I'm persuaded that the art of public relations did not exist in Peter's day as it does today. I mean, there were no ad men or ad women in those days, no PR representatives for individuals or government officials. But Peter's first letter contains a very definite strategy for the church in any age to establish and improve its image and reputation in the community that it is in, whether it's in some small rural community or a large urban center. We know that it works because the presence of the church within the Roman Empire grew so strong despite prejudice, despite persecution. The church's reputation grew so strong that it survived the fall of the Roman Empire and it thrives to this day, stronger than the Roman Empire ever was. So let's take a look at 1 Peter and the PR plan that he provides to help churches impact their neighbors 
and their community. So strategy number one, Peter says, live holy, not holier than thou lives. You got that? Live holy, not holier than thou lives. First Peter, a couple of passages in First Peter, the first chapter, look down at verse 13. He says, therefore, gird your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now go down to chapter two, verses, uh, beginning in verse one. He says, therefore, putting aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. And then one more in chapter two, this time verse nine and 10. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of the darkness into His marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now the main accusation lodged against Christians is not about what we preach, it's about what we practice. People are drawn by the forgiveness and the hope offered in the gospel. They are turned off by people who profess to be Christians, but they live with no better way than they themselves live, or even worse. Imagine someone who confesses that they're Christians uh, and live in a way and in a style that is worse than someone who doesn't live as a Christian. Talk about bad PR in the community. So there's no attraction because there's no proof that the faith actually impacts the one who claims Christ. Now I read a couple of passages here and I want you to note that everything Peter mentions in these passages is something that is real and dynamic in a person's life. It's not ceremonial. It's not cerebral, it's real action. He talks about sobriety, he talks about obedience, he talks about holy behavior. He says we're the ones that have no malice, no envy, no slander, no sneakiness. People who actually see themselves as called by God to a different lifestyle described in the Bible as priests or a nation of spiritual royalty, a people that know and act like they belong to God personally. That's what other people ought to be seeing when they look at us. You know, there's no faking a genuinely holy life. It stands out from the crowd. It shines despite the darkness. It speaks without uttering a single word. If we have to explain if we have to excuse, if we have to defend our lifestyle, we lose any impact on those around us for Christ. A genuinely holy life, however, immediately makes a statement and creates a positive effect no matter who or where we live, and no matter who is around us. They are impacted by our lives. And so our public relations strategy, the first one, live holy lives, not holier than thou lives, live holy lives. Strategy number two, Peter says, practice good citizenship. Chapter two, verse 13 to 25, I won't read that, pretty long passage. As Christians, we're good at pointing out the failures of godless leaders and worldly government policies, but our criticism is not what impresses others about us. That we rant and rave on the internet about how bad you know, the president is or this guy is, that's not what impresses people about us as Christians. If there was ever a government easy to criticize and find fault with, the Roman government was it. Brutal, godless, immoral, self-serving, and you know what, they didn't care. <laughs> They didn't care that they were that way. 
You either put up with it or we kill you. That was it. It was a pretty you know, easy attitude that they had towards their citizen. But listen to what Peter says about a Christian's attitude towards the system in which he lived. Let's go to chapter two and let's begin reading in verse 13. Chapter two, beginning in verse 13. Again, I said a long passage, but Peter says it a lot better than I can. He says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as a bond slave of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience towards God, a man bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in His steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in His mouth. And while being reviled, He did not revile in return. While suffering, He Himself uttered no threats, but kept entrusting Himself to Him who judges righteously. And He Himself, bore our sins in His body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by His wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. Everything about the government and the social system of slavery, the burden that all of this created for the Christian was unfair. The Roman government was unfair. The system of slavery that existed at the time was unfair. But what does Peter tell these people about their situation? Rebel? Revolt? Criticize? No, he reminds them that regardless of the system under which they live, they are citizens of another place. They are subjects of another ruler whose leadership and example they follow. As citizens of the kingdom, their conduct, their contribution, their calling is governed by a heavenly ruler and their good conduct and their sincere service and loyalty and devotion are a witness to the fact that they serve a much higher power than the earthly government that rules over their very short time here on earth. Good Christians are good citizens who lead by example and service and involvement in the affairs of their nation, not just criticism or self-imposed isolation. Groups who stop paying taxes, people who hide out in the woods and practice fake spirituality never impress their fellow citizens about the power of God or the sincerity of their faith. Another PR strategy for the church that Peter explained, strategy number three, love your own. Love your own, chapter three. Let's read together, beginning in verse one. In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. And let not your adornment be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Thus Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. And you husbands likewise live with your wives in an understanding way as with a weaker vessel, since she is a woman, and grant her honor as a fellow heir in the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. To sum up, 
let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Love your own. Few of us ever get the chance to be famous. Few of us ever get the opportunity to get up and preach. I mean, in this congregation of three to four hundred people, there are only one or two or three, perhaps, or four that have the opportunity to preach on a regular basis out of four hundred. But very few of us who are preachers get the opportunity to preach to a hundred thousand or to ten million. We don't usually have that kind of a platform. And very few of us get to write a best-selling book promoting our Christian ideas. Most of us lead ordinary lives out of the spotlight. And the only people who notice us are our family and our friends, our co-workers, neighbors, church family. Most of us have ordinary jobs and hobbies. And so the thing that most people notice about us are the ordinary things in our lives, like our families and how we treat our families. Your neighbor may not know what you think about the Trinity or the second coming of Jesus. Your friends or co-workers probably don't understand or really care about the teachings of the Bible concerning the use of music in worship or how to choose elders. But you know what? They know how you treat your wife and they know how you treat your husband and they know how you treat your children, and they know how you treat your friends, and they know how you act towards your co-workers. They know how you resolve disputes, and they know about your kids, and how you help or don't help your aging parents, or your sick sister-in-law, and so on and so forth. In other words, the most frequent and dynamic advertising tool you have for your faith and this church is how you treat your own family day in and day out, because that's what the world notices. People are not impressed by your doctrine. They are impressed by how your doctrine affects your life in a situation that they can relate to. And the most common situation that people can relate to is family life. This is why the Bible makes how a man deals with his family the main criteria in judging his suitability for leadership in the church. We've often made the mistake of selecting people as elders who were good businessmen, they knew how to make money. But nowhere in the Bible does it say a man who is a good businessman is at the same time qualified somehow to be an elder. But it does say that a man has to know how to lead his own family and to keep order in his own family in order to be truly qualified to be an elder. A happy, balanced, faithful family is the best way to promote the sincerity and the effectiveness of your faith. No use preaching the gospel, no use telling people everything you know about the doctrines of the Bible if you and your wife are always fighting. If your kids are rebels, where, where's the testimony in that? This is why Mormons, for example, make this the key idea in their TV commercial. I mean, their beliefs are very strange and based on flimsy evidence, so they appeal to the community by pointing to their strong family values. And you know what? It works. It works. Why? Because everybody can relate to family values, because we all belong to a family. For them, it may be just a marketing approach, but for us, it has to be the actual way that we are in real life. Strategy number four, suffer patiently. Suffer, as a PR tool, suffer patiently. You know, we don't have time this time to read this very long passage, but Peter summarizes the thought in chapter three. So let's go to chapter three, <clears throat> verse 13 to 16. He says, and who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled 
but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence, and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. You know, the early Christians were accused of all sorts of things in order to fuel the fire of their persecution. They were accused of sedition. They were accused of public mischief. They were accused of secrecy. Some even said that they were cannibals because they misunderstood the idea of the communion, you know, eating the flesh, drinking the blood. Some actually took that literally and were accusing early Christians of actually you know, participating in some sort of cannibalistic rites. But Peter tells them to continue doing good and living holy lives as their testimony of faithfulness so that their accusers would be ashamed of charging them with evil. Today we're accused of being legalistic or hypocritical or concerned more with our internal disagreement and ceremonies than the plight of the poor and the need to evangelize the lost. How do we answer such things? Well, we do it by suffering patiently our own troubles and our own trials, by demonstrating our zeal to share the gospel, by being sensitive and open to sharing the love of God with those around us who are in need. You know, nothing has changed in 2,000 years. Christians are still alienated, maligned, and misunderstood by most people. We need to remember that everyone in the world suffers. <laughs> Everybody suffers. Whether they have faith or not, everybody suffers. We generate the best public relations when we demonstrate an attitude of faith and love and service despite the trials and sufferings that we encounter. This is what inspires non-believers. Just because you're suffering, that, that's not what inspires non-believers. They're, they're observing how you handle the trial that you're going through. That's what inspires them. And then one last PR strategy for the church that Peter mentions, of course, be faithful. Be faithful, chapter five, again, read with me. Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men likewise be subject to your elders. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety upon Him because He cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary the devil prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to His eternal glory in Christ will Himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To Him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Note Peter's final exhortation is to the elders and then to the flock that the elders shepherd. He tells the elders that if they are not faithful themselves in their leadership, they jeopardize the safety of the flock. You see, the flock belongs to the shepherds. They are responsible for it, no one else. Ministers and deacons and teachers, we help the elders, but in the end, they will be held accountable by God, no one else. If the sheep are weak, if the sheep are directionless in the first place, then the place to look is to the shepherds. If they're conducting themselves and serving as they should, I've said it many times, you cannot rise above your own leadership. As the leadership rises, they bring the sheep with them. He then speaks to the congregation and says that they are faithful to Christ in the way they are submissive and submitting to their shepherds. I mean, shepherds need to be faithful in their leadership and the flock needs to be faithful in following the lead of the shepherds. 
So there is a burden of responsibility both on the leaders and the followers, and God will expect a judgment from both. Faithfulness and humility is required by both groups. Why? Peter says, because Satan is there to devour. Satan can just as well devour a leader, a shepherd, as a sheep. Elders who crave power, elders who crave control, prestige, will be destroyed by their own pride and destroy the souls that God has given them to charge over. And saints who are too proud to submit to the word, too proud to submit to the spirit or to the leaders that God has placed over them will wreck their faith and create division within the church. No one is impacted by lukewarm Christians and no one is inspired by leaders who are too proud or worried or tangled up in worldly pursuits to lead properly. Brothers and sisters, disbelievers are not impressed with a faith that we are not willing to sacrifice ourselves for. That's what impresses them. You know, every church, no matter how big or small, has similar problems and challenges. Every church wants to grow. Every church wants to make budget. Every church has to deal with discouragement and apathy and division. Every church. I could preach this sermon anywhere. What's different about congregations is how they deal with these things. Some of them they just throw up their hands and they quit and they simply go through the motions, you know, what I call the Sunday Wednesday routine. Sunday Wednesday, Sunday Wednesday, Sunday Wednesday. You know, they go, we're, do, we're doing church. And others throw away the best parts of their heritage and they try new doctrines or new religious styles in an effort to infuse some life into the body. And some hopefully go back to God's word and reread carefully what the Spirit teaches and directs churches to do in times like these, for problems like these and challenges like these. And so Peter tells this church that is tired and discouraged and afraid and disillusioned that they must take the spiritual offensive and he lays out a plan that will keep them motivated and viable during a difficult period in their history. And this same plan I offer to you, brethren, as an invitation for you to respond to in your lives, in your walk with Christ. Peter's plan and my invitation are one and the same to all who are listening to the message I say. Invitation number one, renew your commitment to holy living. No church program or project can replace the holy and pure lives of all the members witnessed by the world. Strategy number two, Practice good citizenship. We're not of the world, but while we're in it, we have to try to make it a better place to live in. Invitation and strategy number three, make sure you're loving your family. Your spouse and family are the first witnesses called to prove if you are a true Christian or not. Just ask yourself, if you declare, I'm a Christian, I'm mature, I do this and I do that, will your wife and will your children, or will your husband and will your children say amen? Because if they don't say amen, something is wrong. Invitation number four, learn to suffer patiently, that you do not abandon your attitude of kindness and mercy and hope while you suffer shows that Christ truly lives in you. Remember, Everybody suffers, but some do it more like Christ than others. And then invitation number five, keep the faith. It's easy to slack off, it's easy to grumble, it's easy to quit. God needs people who will hang in there no matter what, because these are the ones who have truly seen the light of heaven and can witness from this perspective. Don't you want to hear a witness from someone who has tasted heaven? This is our plan for success. This is our plan for growth. This is our plan for harmony, for glory, for churches everywhere. This is God's plan for revival for this or any congregation that desires to do the greater things that Jesus promised His disciples in John chapter 14, verse 12. So if you need to put this plan into practice in your life, if any part of this plan can help you grow as a Christian, can help you give a better witness to your family and your community, if we can help you through prayer, or if we can be a witness of your confession of faith as we baptize you, whatever way that we can minister to you tonight, 
we encourage you to come forward now as we sing our song of encouragement. Bobby.